What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, make sure you share the video, and leave a comment. Got a special guest on today, Big Rob. I'm going to have Rob introduce himself. And Rob, tell the people a little bit about you, where you're from, man, and how much time you did. Okay, Chad, so my name is Robert Rosso. I'm originally from California, um, L.A. area, a town called San Pedro. Um, in 1997, I got arrested for a conspiracy uh, charge out of Arkansas. I was um, I was originally off for two years, and uh, I with the snitch package, and I uh, declined the offer, and they gave me a mandatory life. So they used I had two prior drug convictions. I did a I did a uh, I did some time in California State Prison. I did some time in Arkansas Department of Corrections, both cocaine charges. And then I ended up uh, getting out of California and um, starting um, what, what they said was a methamphetamine conspiracy. So, yeah. So anyway, I ended up uh, getting getting sentenced to life without the possibility of release. I did a total of uh, 23 months, I mean, 23 years, eight months and one day. And I got out on compassionate release in part thanks to you, bro. <laughs> I appreciate it. But man, it ain't about me. It's, it's about you and you know, as far as the compassionate release thing goes, man, hey, it ended up working out for a bunch of people. And I'm happy for that. Let me ask you this, right? How old were you when you were sentenced to life? When you actually walked in the courtroom on that day and you were sentenced to life, how old were you? 27. 27 years old. How did it feel for the judge to say, hey, I'm sentencing you to life? Okay, so uh, I knew it was coming. And uh, to be honest, that morning, I'd been up a couple of days getting high in the jail. And they'd switched my date from August to July 17th. They moved me up because there was a bunch of talk about escape risk and blah, blah, blah. Plus, I got a, I got charged in Arkansas, you know, uh, the Western District, Fort Smith. I was the first person to get life without the possibility of release on a drug case in that district. So they made a big deal out of it. And um, so anyway, I'd been up a couple of days. And uh, the morning that they told me I was going to court, I'd smoked a joint. Uh, I was high. They said, hey, Rosso, you know, you're going to sentencing. And, it, and it, it, you know, so when I when I went into the courtroom, I was I was I was numb anyway, you know, sleep deprived. Uh, what did it feel like? Um, like I said, I, I expected it. But there was a uh, it was it was hard because I had family in the courtroom. And, um, you know, my mom is a religious person and she thought that you know, somehow there's going to be a divine intervention. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like someone's going to swoop down and not give me life. And it just didn't work out that way. So hearing her wail in the courtroom was really tough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough pill to swallow when you're 27 years old and you're thinking, damn, this is it. I'm going to die in this place, man. This yeah. is it. Did you think you were going to die in there? No, not in the beginning. So in the beginning, I had all the faith about appeals. You know, I had a, had some, uh, uh, family was able to help me. So I was able to get good attorneys, uh, stuff like that. So I, I didn't, it, did, it wasn't real to me at first, you know, uh, it only really became real after I lost my 2255 and that was pretty quick. So we filed direct appeal, um, pretty much by 2000, you know, within a couple of years I was wiped out. So that's when it felt real. That's exactly when it felt like that you know, I wasn't going to get out. So there were different periods in my life when it absolutely felt like that was the end. But uh, because I followed the laws in the end, I, I knew it was only a matter of time, but I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to happen like it happened. I thought I'd be another five years or so. Yeah. And then, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about gang affiliations and prisons sure. and the dirty white boy sure. gang. Sure. So, I mean, you're a pretty well-known dude, right? And, and one of the reasons is because someone by the name of Big Jerry. Big Jerry got hit in prison, right? And, you know, I, I, had, I had known about that years ago and always wondered, who is this dude that hit this dude, right? Yeah. And now, yeah. finally, you know, I find out that it's you. Can you talk a little bit about the Dirty White Boy Gang? Sure. So um, when, I came, when, I, when I came in, it was September of 98, and I, I started off at um, USP Leavenworth. And I, when I came into Leavenworth, uh, of course, I, when I did time in uh, California, you know, I knew a lot about gangs and it was um, the brand who was locked down and um, a lot of Nazi lowriders. So I did my time because of the way it worked out. I did most of my time in Chino, in Central and in uh, the one level one yard. So I was around a lot of NLR. So I was familiar with gangs through that. 
Um, when I got into the federal system, when I came in Oklahoma City, I started hearing a lot about the Dirty White Boys. Uh, not too much about the brand. They were The Aryan Brother was locked down. That's what people were saying. And it just so happened that on the flight that I came into Leavenworth with was a dude named uh, Big Mac or Tim McElhaney, and he was going to trial. So he came in, we came in on the same flight and then we came in on the same bus. But of course he went and got slammed down. I went out in general population. So as far as the DWBs and Dirty White Boys, you know, um, how I found out mostly about them was there was a guy named uh, Dusty. And uh, Dusty was an NLR to California and uh, Dustin Burris, his name Dusty, people know him in the system. So Dusty, uh, we have a lot of similar backgrounds. We're about a year or so apart, both grew up surfing, both grew up slash punk rock scene. Um, I'm a couple years older, but anyway, we both had uh, families uh, still together, mom and dad still married. He was Mormon, I was Catholic. Uh, we both been to the CDC, a lot of background similarities. So uh, there was no NLR. In, in the feds uh, active, I should say, there was no gang structure for NLR in, in 1998. So the NLRs were either running independent or like Dusty was hooked up with the Dirty White Boys. So through Dusty, I ended up hanging out with a lot of DWBs. That's how I got hooked up with the Dirty White Boys uh, in Leavenworth. And that was um, pretty pretty quick into, into, into my bid. Um, you know, it was, when I really got in, when I really got clicked up with them was about two, when I lost my 2255. So by that time, every time they got locked up because of my affiliation, I got locked up. So there was a point to when I said, hey, you know, I'm in, let's, you know, let, let's roll. That That's what happened. Yeah. You got a patch? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as a Dirty White Boy gang member, you end up, they allege, right? You end up hitting Big Jerry, right? Yes. Why does yeah. Big Jerry get hit? Well, so there's a lot behind that. So Big Jerry was at that time actually prospecting. Um, you know, some people don't know that, but so I like Jerry quite a bit, man. Jerry is a, is a, has a really good hearted dude. Um, the circumstances that led to that day when I did that wasn't planned whatsoever. It was, it was a total fluke. Um, there, first of all, we had church or meeting on the yard that day. Everybody was drunk and I'm talking, every brother was drunk or affiliate that was there. And, um, the conversation wasn't about Jerry in the beginning. Um, there were some rumors about certain things Jerry may or may not have done, but, uh, what actually happened to escalate to that, that particular day was actually, uh, um, uh, one of the brothers, his name was Nonos, um, who was prospecting Jerry, kind of said some stuff on the bleach or some crazy stuff about uh, uh, how he can go to uh, staff and get somebody locked up. It, he, again, he was drunk. It was just some crazy thing he spit out that was like everybody had to take a double tech. Like, he, did he just say that? And when all that happened, um, kind of to clean it up because of the issues that were going on with Jerry, he said, look, I'll just go hit Jerry. So him and, and, and a total of five other of my brothers went after Jerry that day. And uh, they all fought Jerry. Jerry didn't go down one bit. And uh, Jerry's a big guy. So they, Jerry got a bloody nose. They had three o'clock recall. And uh, what happened was, again, everybody's drunk, uh, running back to the units. And uh, we had no knives. In, I was in B lower. And, and we, as, as DWBs, had no knives in that unit at the time because there was some incidents upstairs the day before so i'm the only one in there i'm the, i'm the only dirty white boy in that unit with jerry so i'll never forget i look at tc and youngster and i said man uh you guys gonna help me out with this one or what you know do you guys just poke the bear bro <laughs> he's coming he's coming in the unit like no he's gonna check in i'm like you guys don't know jerry if you think jerry's not gonna check in jerry's gonna go down you know and uh long story short i ran in the unit um, went and got a friend, a mutual friend of Jerry and me. His name was Alex Salco. And I said, bro, get my, not a dirty white boy, just a friend. I said, bro, get my back. And he I said, uh, he goes, what's up? And I said, look, if I just start getting my ass stomped, man, help me out. Otherwise stay out of it. He said, with who? And I said, with Jerry. He said, Jerry. And I said, man, with Jerry. So there were, there happened to be a sardine can lid on his bulletin board. 
We used to chop vegetables, weapon, you know what I'm talking about. Actually, it was, it was a mackerel can or a sardine can, but it was the long ones from back in the day and they bent over. They have a little ring on them. Just in, just like in, on a fluke, I grabbed it and there was a rubber band. I put the rubber band on the, on the end of the, the ring and I tucked it in my sweatshirt arm. Went outside, walked one way, to make sure to see where the cops are. Knew Jerry was coming. I knew it was just a matter of time. He walked in the unit and I met him at the door. I didn't want to let him get inside. Um, again, so I hit him and he didn't feel it, bro. I ain't going to lie. That dude didn't feel it. He boxed my ears. And it was just like, as he knocked me down, I remembered, man, I got this thing on me, you know, and I pulled it out and just started slashing. And uh, that's what saved me. And uh, that and uh, when all the cops came rolling in, they didn't they didn't get in the way because there was so much blood. He got cut a lot. You know, it caused a lot of blood activity because it was face and, and chest. And um, so uh, there was a point to where uh, he got a mop ringer and he was about to he was about to lay me out for real. Like he, he was he was going to get me, you know, and because of the way he was going to swing, the cops got in the middle. And was able and stopped it, you know. And I always say that the cops say me. That's my little joke. But that's what happened. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not trying to impress nobody. I'm just saying how how that happened. That's what happened. Did you ever did you ever worry about running into him in the system after that anywhere? I'm not worried, but I figured I would at some time, you know, crossing through. And I, you know, whatever happens, happens. You know, uh, like I said, uh, me and Jerry had a past, man. Uh, we were tight. Um, I said some things about him. He said some things about me. Um, we worked them out. Um, that day, things just just happened. You know what I mean? It was just it, it just it just happened, man. You know, I don't I don't hold. I know he's made comments towards me, not even bad ones. You know, um, there was there was a guy in my cell in Lewisburg years later named Rosie Russo, and he was uh, when the doors locked. He said, "Man, you know who I am?" And I said, "What is this? I'm Jerry Benham's good friend." And I said, "Oh." Here we go. You know, here, here we go. Anyway, he just said, man, Jerry said, you got him, you know, but if you, if you guys run across each other, he's going to, he's going to get you, whatever, which I, I, I expect nothing less or in the prison systems, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Let me ask you this. What was the most dangerous prison you think you've ever been in? Uh, um, you know, so all prisons have their day and I've heard you guys talk a lot, you and some of the dudes at Big Sandy and, and I've heard nothing, everything you've talked about, 100% real. Um, so I, I would say that uh, that Leavenworth, because I was spent 10 years in USPs and the USPs I was in was Leavenworth and Lewisburg. I've never been to the new USPs. OK, I started going to FCIs. For the reason, cancer. I got cancer, and uh, that's how I ended up in in uh, FCI. So I would have to say Leavenworth. Um, although I'll say it was a blast too, man. And and, and like my family or, or or friends or people that have never been to prison trip when I say that. Like I had a great time in Leavenworth. It was nuts because I stayed high, I stayed drunk, I was in the mix, I was just doing the whole, you know, I was doing it, the, the prison thing. Um, but as far as violence. Um, I will say that 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 Cummins in Arkansas Department of Corrections may have been uh, um, it, it's a different world of uh, that, that state prison system than anything I've been in, especially at that time. A lot of homosexual activities, a lot of dudes getting turned out uh, and that stuff was condoned, not condemned back then in those days in Arkansas, you know, so that there was a lot of that 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 uh, that pressure punk shit that was going on. That made that a weird system. You know what I'm saying? But um, as far as uh, it's, I'd have to say Leavenworth, because when I went to Lewisburg, bro, uh, Lewisburg had its day, too. When I got there in 2003 from 2005, I'm going to tell you Lewisburg wasn't shit uh, for two years. Very soft prison. Uh, then it started rocking in 2005 for, you know, till it till it uh, became a smooth. Yeah. Did you ever do time in the smooth over there? No. So they, they opened up the SMU and they actually sent five of us, meaning five dirty white boys to Lewisburg because they were they were originally going to put us there. So there was a warden named Mickey Ray. Mickey Ray became the warden of the north uh, north uh, northeast region. And he had control control over the first SMU, which was G block in Lewisburg. It wasn't the prison. It was a, it was a unit. And um, they needed white guys to put in there straight up. So they put us there, uh, believing that we'd fuck up right off the rip. And um, that's how uh, we had a couple brothers open it up. Um, Billy, 
from uh, um, California opened it up and, uh, but I never ended up in the smooth. I've done, a, I've done a lot of shoe time. You know, while my longest stretch was uh, 11 months out a couple of days and went back in 18 months. That was, uh, yeah. Do you, uh, do you know one of the homeboys, uh, Mikey Eck? Got stabbed in Big Mike. Sandy. They stabbed him in the eyes. Yes. So I I knew Mikey Eck, but I and I was with him at Leavenworth, but I wasn't running with him like that when Mikey Eck left. You know. But yeah. Do you remember yeah, his no, situation? I don't know what happened exactly. No. Yeah. To seven. Day, no. Seven and another dude uh, named Jerry out of Florida. They tackled him to the ground, stabbed him in the eyes. Man, crazy yeah, shit. No, yeah. No. 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 I know what happened to him, but I don't know if it was just because he was a DWB and hit the yard. Because I know a lot of the independents and a lot of other gangs didn't want dirty white boys walking the line. So I don't. I don't know the situation of what actually happened. I've heard different stuff. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's kind of where I'm going right now. Like the DWBs, right? We're like they're yeah. like um, not really well liked by other white gangs, right? <laughs> yeah. For that's that's an understatement. It's an understatement. Yeah, but so tell the people okay. why. Or do they got it wrong? Okay, okay. So, so here's my take. Okay, I can give my take about the whole thing. It's probably the it's, same as mine. So the Dirty White Boys, uh, uh, basically, a soft originated as a softball team. A lot of dudes from Texas. That was the original founders, and um, uh, turn, just it just became something other than a softball team. You know, then uh, it became a game. Um, a lot of different guys have different things about the history. We'll have different uh, say. Some will say it started El Reno. Others will say Three Rivers. Um, some will say that this person was a shot caller, this person, whatever. Okay. So I come in in 98. So at that time, so you had the ABs who were, who were in the federal system. And I would say as a prison gang ran the federal system for X amount of years. And then they started getting slammed down. As they started getting slammed down, there really wasn't no other gangs in, in the federal system. So when I came in in 98, you had some you had a couple different gangs. Um, you had some arms uh, in, in, in Leavenworth at the time. When I first got there, only a few. You had some skinhead gangs in California. Um, uh, I'm not trying to diss it or, or, or miss any gangs or disrespect anybody. I just can't remember any of the gang. There, there wasn't there wasn't a primary gang. So the dirt was dirty white boys. Dirty white boys had a lot of numbers. So anytime um, you get a lot of guys or, or one gang, like arguably what happened to the brand, uh, you start kind of, uh, people say you start praying on your own, so to speak. So um, um, also, in my opinion, the structure, because there was a lack of structure, uh, you got all the new gangs that started coming in in 2003 and 2005, and they were more appealing. So when the new gangs came in, the gang to hate on was the gang that had been around the longest. And because a lot of the bros did a lot of grimy shit, let's put it out there. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay that whatsoever. So uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I mean, but that, that happens with all white gangs, right? So yes. it's kind of like when you're at the top, like, the, like you said, the Aaron brother dudes are like, man, the brand don't run us. They don't tell us what to yes. do. And then because the dirty white boys really were, were the gang at that time. Yes. So it's like, man, fuck them dudes. And then the, the ABTs, you'd be in a place with them where they started getting some status and, you know, started hitting dudes and, and coming across as a violent group. And dudes are like, oh, man, them dudes are scumbags. And I mean, yeah. it's just like that trickle down effect. You know, like obviously the armed dudes, man, there was a point where the armed dudes hated the DWE, DWBs sure. and called, them, yeah. you know, they had the little name, the dweebs and. Shit yeah, like sure. that because they wanted to aspire to be that they wanted to take that position. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you're exactly right. But that, that I, I don't know of, of one white prison gang that like people hold up as like the white prison gang, like everybody that that's done perfect stuff. You know what I'm saying? That, that everybody like looks at and says, wow, like those guys are righteous all the way through. I mean, arguably we can say some stuff about the original brand, but whatever. I and mean, there's, there's that issues too, you know? So my thing is this, though. I mean, really, DWB dudes were kind of like, hey, look, man, we ain't going for no bullshit, right? Like, people are going to respect us. We're not going to – I mean, has it been your experience that you've seen in prison and maybe in Arkansas where people are like, man, we're going to get at them white dudes? Because I interviewed a dude about Alabama. He said, just because dudes were white, man, we're going to do something to them. Do you think there was a point in time where people were like, man, the white dudes don't really have numbers, so we're just going to do whatever we want to these cats? And then – some dudes were like, man, that ain't, that ain't what's happening. We're about to come together, have some unity, and we're going to get busy if we have to. 
Yeah, sure, but I, not not with the Dirty White Boys. Like that that's not have anything to do with the Dirty White Boys. What the Dirty White Boys started, or or what happened? So no, I know that, but I'm just saying. Have you experienced yeah. that? Have, do you think do you think white gangs formed for that reason? Oh, sure. And if and if you look at the history, yeah, yeah. And if you look at the history, and I've, and I've read, and I know you have the history of the brand, um, because I'm from because I'm from California, and because I know some of them. You know, through going through the system, you talk about Silverstein. Uh, Silverstein was in the shoe behind. Uh, they built him his own cage. They called it the dog kennel. That's what the staff called it. Uh, and it was attached to the shoe in um, uh, Leavenworth. And there were times when, you know, we can see him on the on the screen. So, you know, I've been familiar with uh, they had cameras monitoring him at all the times. And there was a one time when we picked up the phone and he was on the other end. So uh, my bro TC, who got killed, um, uh, he was able to talk to Silverstein for a while. You know, and uh, anyway, so I'm getting a little bit off track, but uh, yeah, so there's sure, certainly what I think white prison gangs definitely had their day. And, and, and I'm not and the reason why I originally first started. Now there's a gang culture that, that goes across all races, Chad. And, you know, and it's it's I mean, it's where I'm at. I'm I'm in a, a rural part of Arkansas. I'm right across the line. you got a lot of um, of UABs. So I'm right over here. Oklahoma's I can throw a rock and hit Oklahoma. So they're real big right across the line here. And it's a trip, you know, from 23 years ago. And there wasn't no white prison gangs on the or white gangs on the street. There's a whole bunch of these dudes over here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you feel like do you feel like when you got into that gang, when you got into the gang, did you feel like, man, them dudes were your bros, man? Like these are your brothers. This is your family. You got a life sentence. This is your family away from your family. Okay. Okay. So this is what happened with me. No, I I so there was somebody named Kenny Lasseter. Gator, we can call him Gator, whatever. So Kenny uh, called the shots for a period of time and he was on me to, to get tipped up. Dusty never was. Dusty never said, hey, this is the way to go, okay? Again, I started getting locked up uh, when they did. And uh, one night I got drunk and Kenny was on me. Now, uh, and and I, 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 I agreed to get patched up, totally fucked up, drunk in the shoe. You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, dude, I feel like they're my bros. I didn't like a lot of them. That was one of the issues. Uh, the ones that were there with me, it's not, I couldn't stand a couple. Some of them were all right. And I really liked like three of them at the time, if I remember, that was about the ratio. Um, but because of Kenny, because of Dusty, because of Billy, because of a certain few is why I really decided to go. But it was like, uh, as soon as I got my patch, man, it, there was, it, it was, it was like, it was like drama, you know, it was like, unnecess of course you sign up for that, but it was like unnecessary stuff. You know what I mean? And then uh, some years later when I was at Lewisburg, the dude who was running our car, then uh, a Billy got locked up, sent to the smoot and I got the keys. So at, for three years from 2007, I mean, 2003 to 2006 for sure. So that was me. And, um, you're constantly having to, and there's a lot of them I like. At one point, I think there were 17, you know, and that's hard. You know that, you know, you you know when there's that many dudes from one crew, I don't care if it's a car, a gang, a neighborhood, it's tough. So, and you got ones that want to go do stuff. Uh, you got them, the ones that want to take uh, contracts or, or stuff. And, uh, you know, and I was against prostitution and contracts, you know, for other races at that time. Yeah, that's, that's, so there was a time when it was like, yeah, man, but, but there was always that feeling that somebody within us was, was uh, looking out for their, their own interest or didn't have, you know. Some of the viewers, right? Some sure. of the viewers might be like, man, what, what does he mean by contract? Can you explain a little bit? Sure. So we've been paid uh, money by other people to hit other people. So for example, uh, let's say Italians would pay us X amount of dollars to go hit somebody that's not Italian, maybe black, maybe a Puerto Rican or whatever. So uh, when I first got in, um, Wolf was uh, a guy named Robert Wolf out of Stockton. He was, he had, he was, he was calling shots and he took uh, contracts uh, left and right. And um, so if he got a contract for 500, just depending on, on who was a prospect uh, you know, so you get one guy and their prospect would go and they'd get a couple dollars, maybe split it 250. 
the shot caller usually got the other half, whatever. It went different ways, D- different contracts had different ways. There was, there was sometimes that you get three grams of heroin to do this. So di- a different contract could be, uh, it just depends on the person, how bad that person wanted somebody else hurt, hit, whatever. Yeah. So I want the viewers to know that back then, right? So a dude could be like, hey, look, man, a mob dude from New York, be like, look, man, I got a problem with this dude. I don't really want to, you know, handle it. I'll shoot you guys 500 bucks. I'll shoot you a thousand dollars. I want this guy off the yard. Go stab him. So somebody would stab this dude on a contract for five hundred dollars, right? Absolutely. Without a yes. shot, wouldn't even think twice. Yeah. So there was one that I was. Uh, I don't want to because it was it was really investigated. Feds came in. Uh, they they had some kind of a mob link to it, but the the there was specifically they had to have a, a slice on the face too. You know, they wanted blood on the face. They wanted they wanted him cut. You know, so there there would be. There would be specific ways that some guys wanted stuff done. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Do you think that kind of led to the bad rep for the DWBs? That wow. type of shit? Uh, that and, and, and patching up guys that, that really probably had no business to that, that, that uh, ended up doing some foul shit, like locker knocking instead of stealing. You know, not going up to somebody's cell, but, but stealing, but breaking into somebody's cell. That's foul stuff, you know? Again, so because I know there's going to be guys who <laughs> can only imagine it's not only the dirty white boys. Dirty white boys had it for so long. They were the only uh, game, real game presence for so long in the feds. That's why the reputation got so bad and the quality of guys that were being patched. So they weren't going for quality. They're going for quantity once upon a time, as did some of the other games that started faltering after 2005. All the time you did in prison, who do you think was the most dangerous gang in federal prison? Dangerous gang. Uh, so I, I'm going to I'm going to have to say, you know, I'm just I'm just thinking off the top of my head because there's a lot of different dangerous dudes in gangs. OK, well, anybody knows that. And there's there's some, you know, some that are killers that are running in gangs that are not doing killing. So they're, they're not so dangerous. But I would have to say I'd have to say the enemy. I'd have to say them. In, in my view, uh, I grew up in California, so I knew a lot of them. Um, it's the way they can get things done, and it's their it's uh, it's their reach that made them so dangerous. Uh, and they're going to go home on the streets and live that, you know, where a lot of white guys aren't. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I, I'd have to say the enemy I, for sure. Yeah, and I, I would say that pretty confidently. Yeah, I agree 100. percent I mean, if yeah. the big homie tells a man hit him do yeah. this, they're doing it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It don't yeah. matter if they got a year left. They're going to hit you. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're going to hit you hard. Yeah. Definitely a dangerous gang. So we're going to we're going to go outside of that. But you ended up changing your life in prison, right? Sure. Okay. So this is what happened with me. So in 2000 and, in 2005, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. I was at Lewisburg at the time. I was pissing blood. That's how I found out. First, I started pissing blood. And they wouldn't do anything. And then I started pissing uh they're actually blood clots. So coming off my tumors, they look like, uh, man, they were, they were blue, you know? So it felt like, you know, when I take a leak, it felt like my, my, my piss would stop and, and little things would squirt out me. You know what I mean? So it's about nine months. I went through that, got bladder, got diagnosed with recurring bladder cancer. Uh, um, so they, they got tired of the amount because it kept reoccurring every few months. So eventually they, they made me a care level four and they sent me to Butner. And I went to Butner, North Carolina. I went to the FMC. I was there uh, 10 months. And um, during that time, there, that's like a neutral zone, okay? So I was keeping in contact. So I, got a, I arrived at Butner the first day. You had two SIS guys. One of them wanted to lock me down. He wanted to keep me locked uh, either in the shoe on the fifth floor um, because, again, because of my jacket, you know, and it said I just came from having the keys. So, yeah, it was a big deal. So, you know, you got the good guy and the bad guy, the nice guy, the SIS said, all right, we're going to let you out, see how you act. Kind of broke it down. I got there, saw that it was a neutral zone. You know, it really is because you got a lot of guys that are dying. Not saying there's not dudes that get at each other, you know, but in general, there's a lot of sick dudes at the FMC. You know what I'm saying? So during that time, uh, I got strung out on pills, man. I got strung out really bad on pills. I only ran across one one bro there, I kept in contact with a lot of them from Lewisburg for a while till they started shutting me down on my mail. And um, the guy, he came up, he was at a low and uh, 
uh, some old man that I was selling was saying the dude got a patch because he bought everybody ice creams. All right. So that was at, that was at Siegelville. Okay. So I, I didn't, I, I wasn't digging this dude too much. I didn't like his style whatsoever. He was on a different floor. So anyway, I didn't really hang out with him. That was the only other dirty white boy in, in, in the hospital. So there they said that they believed that I was um, had a relationship with the nurse. That's why I got transferred, but I had to stay. There was allegations of it, but I had to stay within the complex because of, I needed cancer treatment. So um, at the time, they just they had uh, Butner FCI 2, Butner FCI 1, the low in the camp. Obviously, I can't go to the camp, but if you're in administrative custody, which everybody in Butner Hospital is, that's in general pop. When you're in administrative custody, they can send you anywhere. They can send you to the low. There's a lot. There's lifers in the low that came from USPs to uh, that came, well, went from USPs to the lows, and or to the low, I should say, and um, FCI one and FCI two. Well, there was a there was a dude that was an ex brother, um, uh, Mike. Uh, I forgot his last name right now. I'm just drawing a blank. He was at the two, and he had a separation against me. He found out I was there, so he put a separation on me, so I couldn't go to the two. That's where I was supposed to go was to Butner 2. So they sent me to Butner 1. So at Butner 1, it was, uh, I walk in, bro, and it's uh, it was like a college campus. It was crazy. The feel of the place was crazy. Now, it took me a second to get used to it. You've got child molesters. Um, you know, they, they, it's been notorious for a dropout yard. Um, uh, uh, the, the sex offender program, the there's the dudes hiding out. It's just, you know, it's, 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 it's awesome on its face, but you know that there's a lot of fucked up people there. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're in prison and doing the prison thing, you know what I'm saying? So, um, uh, there was a couple guys there. It was, uh, Carmine Persico and Joey Testa. And I knew they were all right. You know what I mean? So that's who I hung around with at the same time. Uh, I decided to get clean. You know, I, I started doing heroin in prison. I never did heroin on the street. I never used a needle on the street. I was a coke guy, marijuana coke. Started doing meth the last time I was out a little bit. Well, a lot of it, whatever. I drank meth in my coffee. That's how I did meth. So I didn't shoot it, smoke it, snort it. Not that it matters, but I drank it. Um, so uh, I was in Leavenworth uh, 15 minutes and stuck a needle of heroin in my arm and didn't look back for 10 years. So I was, became an opiate guy. Anyway, so I made a decision to get clean. I was on Percocets. I had a script at the time and I winged myself off uh, probably because I was around Carmine, older Italian guy. You know, I am Italian. My, my last name's Rosso. I don't run Italian, but you know what I mean? So uh, my grandparents are from Italy, you know? So anyway, um, so uh, because I had other people that were clean and, and uh, um, I just started uh, doing my own thing, meaning I started writing uh, I wasn't no longer involved in any kind of politics whatsoever. Uh, and things just begin to change for me. Now, I want to make it clear because there's a, there's a whole, well, dudes, have been, for the last 10 years, I've heard different things about me. So when I got to Butner FCI 1, nobody ever pulled me up and said, this is a dropout yard. This is, they did say during orientation, there's a lot of sex offenders. So I never got pulled up to say, what's your status? Did you drop out or you quit and whatever the deal was? Nothing. No, SIS never talked to me about any gang stuff. For two years, on the second year, I'm there, and there's a dude named Mark Fitzu. Mark Fitzu is maybe in the that cheese factory where they hide hide dudes. He was testifying against the Ary, the Aryan brother during the death penalty trials. Remember, and the, I think it was ten was the last one. Anyway, so um, a kite was sent from Huff, who was the AB, who had cancer and was in the shoe in the hospital. And I don't know if you know anything about the shoe in the hospital, but it's buried way back there in back of surgery. It's back there. Okay. So for a kite to come out of there, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty badass to be able to get a kite out of there. Kite was intercepted that asked me to, to basically hit Mark, you know? So at that time, uh, the SIS came up and said, you know, uh, what's your, what's your status is that? And I said, listen, I just, I've got cancer. Never said any other words. I got cancer. I'm doing me. That's what I said at that point. Now, what I did do is I was writing. I started writing a lot and I got some notoriety writing. So I ran across somebody who knew Seth Ferranti, who had a website, Gorilla Convict. A lot of guys know it. And uh, Seth found out I was a dirty white boy and, and asked me to do an interview. And I said no at the beginning. 
And uh, then as I was writing, there was people that started outing me. Like I was writing about how clean I was and this and that. And people started saying, hey, man, this guy's a fucking gang banger, piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. You know, I got, I got some of that. Like, you know, so I said, OK, so I did the it interview. Happens. And, it happens sometimes. Yeah, sure, sure. So I did the interview and it was really self-serving, you know. And so I try to I try to be as honest as I could. But long story short, a lot of brothers got offended. OK, and I can see why in retrospect. You know, I kind of buried, uh, I, what I, yeah. So, but it wasn't the guys that knew me, the guys that have always been with me kind of cheered me on. Even some of the got me out said, right on bro. You know, yeah. but, um, it was never, um, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't drop out. I didn't retire. I just faded away from it because of the prisons I ended up going to. And the only other one from there, I went to the deuce. I was, uh, F sad too. After a while stayed there in the hole most of the time because of my writing, as I started getting more um, popularity or, or more media attention, they slammed me down constantly. And, um, and I created my own, I created the situation, you know, and I know, you know, Cedric Dean, he can tell you all about that one day because me and Cedric were like this and we kept getting locked up together. Yeah. So, um, uh, and the only place from there I went was to Terre Haute FCI and um, any administrative uh, prison is, um, you know, you, you got your, you got your cast of characters, <laughs> I guess you'd say. The moral of the you story know. is though that you, you changed your life, right? Oh, absolutely. You, absolutely. Yes. Yes. You learned yeah. the law. You, you won a bunch of cases in prison. You know, you did yeah. a bunch of different stuff, administrative remedies and helping other people yeah. with post conviction and you end up getting out of prison on compassionate release. You're supposed to die in prison, right? Yeah, bro. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the good things that also happened about me and in, in the, 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 the change in my life. Now, I want to say that I relapsed. So I, I went three years, seven months, 14 days or something like that. And then I started getting high again and it's been on and off, you know? So that was the longest period. But during that sober time, when I was totally straight, um, I met a girl and uh, she was a 24 year old psychology student. I was just about 40 years old at the time. She read an article, sent a Facebook request and um, well, we're married and she's living here right now. You know, she stuck by me. Uh, uh, yeah, man, and just incredible, you know. And you're married to her now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just, I just, it's just crazy how things worked out. It's crazy when you start doing right. And I'm, and let, let me be clear, when I say doing right, I'm not talking about just gang stuff. Or I'm talking about when you do right within yourself, when you um, make decisions to clean up, make decisions to take a different path, you know, changes happen. And, and in my, my book, really, really good things have happened in my life, man, you know? And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty fortunate, bro, for real. That's what's up. So listen, before we close the show, right? We've been on here a while. What message would you give to, you know what? I always say, what message would you give to kids? But what message would you give to a dude coming into prison, man? And dude's like, yo, man, what's up? You want to get down with this gang? You want to get tipped up? Because you spent many, many years of your life in that environment, in a gang, what would you say to a young man like that? So my thing would be, and I'm doing prison consulting too, so obviously I'll run into that at some point. So, you know, there's a lot of people that enjoy being in the mix and there's fun and there's a rush in it. There is, there's a, like a lot of thrill in it, you know? But at the end of the day, it's really hard to survive, keep your reputation intact, you know? Because always somebody's going to hate on you for something. It doesn't matter if you're doing right or wrong. Uh, but, what, but what I would really say is, you know, do you. Um, uh, prison isn't a picnic. It's a different experience for every person. It, it depends a lot on your family, where you're from, your financial situation, yada, 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 you can go on. But the, the best thing I would say is I, I would absolutely uh, strongly advise about not getting tipped up with anybody. And, you know, and then we can get into the whole independent white thing too, because that from what I, again, I didn't go to the new USPs when that really started. You know what I mean? And that becomes a gang issue too. So it's hard to walk, especially if you're young, but the, the, it's definitely the, the, the cons far outweigh the pros. Um, if you, if you get tipped up, that's, that's, it's, 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 it's a rush for a moment, but it, it fades, it fades. And it gets old quick. So listen, man, it does, bro. I'm gonna, we might end up doing a part two because we're going to talk about that independent white car and stuff like that. But I want to sure, thank you. Sure. Definitely thank you for coming on the show. I know you might get into the YouTube thing. If you do, I'll definitely thank give you a I'll definitely give you a shout out. I know you're putting a paralegal and prison consultant yeah. firm together. That's yeah. what's up. 
you know, I'll definitely promote your stuff, man. I know you do good work and I appreciate you coming on the show. So with that, blood on the razor. All right, Chad. All right, man. With that, okay, blood bro. On, huh? So I said, okay, take care and keep doing you. You're doing a great job, man. I great. appreciate you, man. Blood on the razor wire TV until tomorrow. All we're right. out. Thank you.